<laughs> well, it's that time of year again. The spookiest spook fest of them all, Halloween. And I thought, what better way to celebrate the season than to go through the first four Castlevanias. Now, I've never been a huge fan of the Halloween season, and that's probably because I'm not a big fan of the horror genre, whether that's in movies, or in this case, video games. But what makes Castlevania different from these other horror games is that it's horror themed. It's not focused on scaring the player. The horror aspect of the game is in its graphics, story, and environments. Back in the day, there wasn't too many horror games on the NES, but I understand that because it's kind of hard to make a game scary with the limitations of the NES. Ladies and gentlemen, the 1986 Jump Scare! Ooh, Freddy's coming. Out of all the horror games on the NES, the Castlevania series did it best. No, it's not scary, but the overall atmosphere of the game is more horror-like than any other on the system. With most of these other games, you're punching giant spiders or walking around throwing rocks, and most of the time the music isn't horror-like at all. But with Castlevania, you're whipping ghouls, fighting monsters, and the music, while it's not that horror-themed either, it has one of the best soundtracks of all time. We wouldn't see the first entry of the Castlevania series in North America until 1987. It was one of the first platform games on the system, and it was known for its horror action-packed gameplay and difficulty. It instantly became a classic due to its original take on the platforming genre. Because of the success of the franchise, the Castlevania series steadily produced games throughout the years, pumping out a game almost every year. But if you're gonna have a marathon, you gotta start from the beginning. So let's take a look at a game that started the classic franchise, Castlevania. Castlevania is an action-packed horror-themed platformer. It was actually released in 1986 for the family computer disk system in Japan, and due to the success of the game, they brought it to the States on May 1st, 1987. The game was developed and published by Konami, and this was the golden age of Konami, back when they actually cared and did something with their lives. The game borrowed a lot of source material from iconic horror cinema, so that's like Frankenstein, the mummy, Medusa, even the main villain, Dracula. They even go as far as to reference the actors of these films in the end credits, of the game. You play the role as Simon Belmont, a vampire killer whose goal is to defeat Dracula. But in order to do that, you must fight your way through multiple different sections of Dracula's castle. The moment you press start, the game plays a cutscene of Belmont walking up to the gates of Dracula's castle and looking off into the horizon to reveal his gigantic lair. I love this little cutscene. It puts a sense of mystery and suspense into the game. You have no idea what you're getting yourself into, but you know for a fact that you have a long journey ahead. After that, the game throws you right in while playing one of the most classic songs on the NES. The Castlevania series has always had some, if not the best, soundtracks on the NES. Every single track is so catchy, adding slight hints of eerie tones that really makes the soundtrack stand out and a mix for an amazing soundtrack that I love. Anyways, you start out in the castle's courtyard, where you can mess around a bit and figure out the controls. Now, this is a platformer, so you got the essentials, like moving and jumping, only the jumping mechanics is a lot different than normal. In the Castlevania series, when you jump, you lose all mobility in the air, so once you jump, you're locked into that position until you land. Now, honestly, this is where most of the difficulty comes from in the later stages. It is a platformer, so you want to be precise on where you jump, but if you can't control yourself mid-air, it's a lot easier to mess up in platforming sections of the game. Your main source of attack is your whip, also known as the Vampire Killer. This thing feels amazing. It has a little delay whenever you use it, and when you hit something, it feels really, really satisfying. It really makes you feel like a whip-wielding vampire killer. <laughs> Shout out to IGN for that last line. Your whip has three levels, each upgrade increasing the length and power of your weapon. The way you find these upgrades is through destroying these candles. You can also find different sub-weapons and hearts to help you out on your quest. Now, in most games, hearts are used to replenish health, but in Castlevania, you use these hearts in exchange for using your special weapons that are found all throughout the game. The sub-weapons are used for another source of attack or are sometimes necessary to progress in certain sections of the game. These weapons are often given to you in the right situations. For example, in level 2 you have these spiky smusher things and you have to get across them or else you'll take major damage. But before this section the game gives you this stopwatch that freezes time, so you freeze time in order to get across. These weapons add strategy. Not only is the game about slashing monsters with your whip, but you also gotta be tactical with the weapons you're given in certain situations. You can also find these power-ups to let you throw two sub-weapons back-to-back, but I didn't figure that out until the very end of the game, so 
Whoops. The combat, the jumping mechanics, and the tactical weapons makes for a very interesting and unique experience. It really does mix up the platforming genre and has this strange pace that you don't really see in a platformer. The game itself is short, ranging from one to two hours if you know what you're doing. There's a total of six stages. Every stage is a section of Dracula's castle and each one has a unique environment that will have a variety of ghouls and monsters that you'll have to fight your way through. The levels themselves are short, but they're also pretty difficult, so it's one of those games where they made it difficult in order to increase the game's length. So if you're going to do this blind, it's going to be a lot more than 1-2 to two hours due to the very difficult level design and bosses. Thankfully, whenever you run out of lives, you have unlimited continues, but once you do run out of lives, you start from the beginning of the stage. Honestly, most of the game is trial and error. The levels are set up the same way for the most part, so it's a matter of memorizing enemy placements and being strategic with your sub-weapons. However, I will say that the platforming sections of the game are probably the most difficult and most frustrating parts of the game. Not only that, but the gravity in this game is very odd to say the least. If you accidentally go even the slightest off a ledge, you will instantly get sucked right into the pit. I'm not really sure if this was a programming error, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. With platformers, I like to have control, and when you're locked in position mid-air and you can't do anything about it, it feels pretty awkward. But the worst is when they start adding enemies into the mix. Whenever you get hit, you get knocked back like 10 feet. And when they start mixing platforming, enemies, and huge knockback, it can get difficult. You want to try your best to stay away from pits during combat as much as possible, because if you get hit, you're very likely to fall to your death. This is probably the biggest complaint of the game. The knockback is simply just too much, and that, combined with the weird jumping mechanics, you can't correct yourself when enemies are flying at you, and some of these enemy patterns are hard to handle. Yes, I'm talking to you, flying Medusa heads. It's seriously one of the biggest drawbacks of the game, but... Once you get used to the jumping mechanics and learn the enemy patterns, it's not that big of a deal. But by the time you do learn these things, you'll have already quit the game and gone on to something else to let out your frustration. Well, that's what I did. Every stage has a boss to end each level, and most of them are pretty challenging, but I will say the first two bosses didn't give me any trouble. But I will also say the next few bosses were a pain to get through. The problem I had with most of these bosses is that they hit you three times and you're dead. Oh, and did I mention you also have a health bar? The way you replenish health is by finding random old turkeys hidden in breakable walls, which, now that I think about it, that's disgusting. I've always found it weird that the Castlevania games have showed the boss's health bar at all times. It also confused me why it's named the enemy's health bar. I mean, he is the enemy, but I've always considered these guys enemies and these guys bosses. Most of the battles could have used some more originality. There were two bosses that did this well. The Frankenstein boss had you not only focusing on Frankenstein himself, but a hunchback that was constantly throwing projectiles at you. The Grim Reaper boss rapidly spawned floating scythes that would gravitate towards you and you would have to destroy them, all while trying to kill Grim Reaper simultaneously. These two were the most difficult, but the most satisfying to kill. Seriously though, the Grim Reaper took me like an hour to beat, and it didn't help that there was a huge section full of Medusa heads and these knights right before the boss. The rest of them, on the other hand, or eh? Like, for crying out loud, the mummy boss basically had two mummies walking back and forth, and all you really need to do was wail on them. The final boss, on the other hand, is a whole different story. The build-up to the final fight with Dracula is so memorable and so suspenseful. I just love the big staircase to the final room where the battle takes place and just seeing that casket open and the music playing and just thinking about all the struggles you had to get here, you think, I'm finally here. Now, the actual battle can be a little tedious at times. First of all, if you die, you respawn at the bottom of the stairs with little to no hearts. And one of the sub-weapons is almost required for killing Dracula, so in order to gain more hearts back, you must farm by destroying these candles and walking down and up the stairs to respawn them. This gets old really fast after dying quite a bit. Even the boss itself is slow. Dracula's way of attack is to throw fireballs, disappear, reappear, throw more fireballs, and repeat. The thing is, is that you can only hit him once every time he appears, and your whip only does one hit point per hit, so most of the battle involves you waiting for him to appear, jump over his fireballs, and hit him for one HP. So to be honest, the final boss is kind of the easiest boss in the game. Once you figure out the pattern on the boss, it's actually really easy, and you wouldn't expect that from a game that's known for its difficulty. Well, after you figure out his pattern, smack him a ton of times, your final blow has you whipping his head with such force that it goes flying off the screen just like the sandbag and home run contest from Super Smash Bros. Like, BOOM! And just like that, I did it. I beat the first Castlevania- OH MY GOSH, WHAT IS THAT? 
Yep, you guys thought wrong. Dracula has a second form that doesn't even look anything like Dracula. Now, this is when the final boss is actually difficult. And it gets even more tedious when you die, because you have to farm hearts, kill Dracula's first form, and then you're finally back here. And it also doesn't help that his final form is not easy to dodge, so you're gonna be dying and repeating this process quite a bit. Honestly, I really have no strategy other than spamming holy water to slow him down while you just whip the crap out of him. The only way I actually beat him was I somehow got the double sub weapon power up and just spammed holy water so he couldn't move at all. So I guess you could say I got lucky. And just like that, I beat the first Castlevania. For real this time. Overall, this game is a classic. From the horror-themed gameplay to the amazing music to its difficulty, Castlevania is one of the greatest NES games on the system. Yes, it's hard. Yes, the jumping mechanics are weird. And yes, the knockback is insane. But it really did mix up the platforming format, and it did it in a way that no one has ever seen. Now, we wouldn't see a sequel to Castlevania until a year later with Castlevania 2, Simon's Quest. And I've heard that this one had some interesting design choices that changed the format of Castlevania just a little bit. So tune in next week in this Castlevania marathon where I'll be taking a look at Castlevania 2, Simon's Quest.